Hello, everyone. I'm Kenny Rice. Welcome to this edition of the Horse Racing Show. Glad you're with us. Uh, we're going to go outside the box today, which is where horse racing needs to go from time to time to try to figure out some of the things that go on that confuses the masses, even confuses some people in the sport itself. For example, recently, Bob Baffert, most high-profile person in all of horse racing. I don't think there's any doubt about that. He is a friend of mine, but personal feelings aside, he had two horses. Charlington, who won a division of the Arkansas Derby, disqualified. And Gamine, who won an allowance race on that same day. And then, of course, you probably saw her spectacular performance in the Acorn Stakes on Belmont Stakes Day. Uh, she also was disqualified. And because a substance called lidocaine popped up in her system. Yeah, you know what lidocaine is? Yeah, you probably used it. You got a sore back, your shoulder, your knee. You rub it on there, and it helps numb it and relieve the pain. It's not necessarily what you would call a performance enhancer. But a trace amount, picograms, showed up, which are one trillionth of a gram. Yeah, I said one trillionth. And because of that, two horses are disqualified. A lot of attention given that Bafford was suspended for 15 days. And once again, horse racing finds itself in a position where, what's going on? Is there a common sense approach somewhere out there where there's a unified body that can make some decisions and a, you know put together some science with some basic common sense, common courtesy. So we're going to talk about that with Dr. Stuart Brown. He's the new equine safety director at Keeneland. And then later on, Jim Host will join us. He is a pioneer in the sport of sports marketing. National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame member. What a resume he has. And he's also been involved in horse racing. So we'll talk about that and get his take on, is it time for a commissioner? Could there be a commission? Could there be some unified governing body? That's coming up. All right, welcome in on lead guitar as always, Ben Chapins. Hello, Ben. Hello, Kenny. Our ace researcher, Thomas Kenny. Hello, Mr. Thomas. Hey, Kenny, how you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. So uh, we've been talking about commissioners. Most every sport has a commissioner, most big sports at least, known sports. Uh, have you found anyone out there that doesn't have a commissioner, Thomas? Well, on a purely technical level, Formula One doesn't have a commissioner, but they do have a chief executive officer for the Formula One group. So there's somebody to report to, at least somebody that makes decisions. Yes. Which is, is what every sports needs. Now, technically, the ultimate fighting championship does not have a commissioner. Dana White is the de facto commissioner of all MMA. And because they were so strong and got the majority of the good fighters right off and controlled the situation, who was going to fight who, uh, you know, they sort of became the commissioner without officially becoming one, the UFC and Dana White in particular. And that's a sport that's grown. But uh, most other sports, everybody's got a commissioner, right? Football, baseball, basketball, hockey, uh, name a major sport, there's a commissioner. NASCAR, yep. somebody governs them, correct? That's right. So everybody's involved in this except horse racing. Now, the National Thoroughbred Racing Association, uh, they're more of a public uh, service. They're more of a publicity agent. Uh, they can make recommendations, they can make statements, but they have no teeth in terms of enforcing rules. As far as the Breeders' Cup, they're basically there to do that one giant event each year that's so important to horse racing, the Breeders' Cup weekend, of course, which will be at Keeneland this year. And, and that's their job. Uh, they can make recommendations as well, but it's up to every individual state. And how do you get them together? Guys, you know how to get them together? Anybody got a suggestion? Because that's the million-dollar question right now in horse racing. Well, there was some way to make some sort of commission. That that seems to be the common sense thing. It's, you would think like a Supreme Court, obviously. You know, get nine people from across the country. Uh, maybe get something out there where people could say, picograms in a liniment that's used by humans to help ease some pain? How tough is that? Okay, that's the situation. Dr. Stuart Brown joins us next. He'll try to explain, hopefully to me and everyone out there, about this uh, lidocaine picogram and did it really matter in the big picture? And then later on, Jim Host, a true pioneer in sports marketing, will join us to give his take on the racing industry today and maybe, maybe uh, some hope that they could get together and form some either commission or commissioner to govern it. All that's coming up. Stay with us on the Horse Racing Show.
This is the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice, and as always, we appreciate your time. And glad to have with us a man that I go to when I need to know something about the world of medicine and horses, Dr. Stuart Brown, the new equine safety director at the Keeneland Race Course. And Stuart, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's always good to be on with you, Kenny. Now, I'm not here to try a case or, or plead one side over the other. I'm just wanting to clear things up. And uh, the big attention in the last week, and it got news on Sports Center. It got news in publications that don't normally cover horse racing. But Bob Baffert is the face of horse racing. I think most people will agree with that. And he had two of his horses, uh, Charlatan and uh, Gamine, disqualified uh, because uh, basically the local anesthetic that probably most of us has used at times, if you got a sore shoulder or back, uh, lidocaine, uh, was found in there. So... Uh, <laughs> You know, basically what I'm getting at is, is lidocaine a performance enhancer? Is this a big deal or was this much ado about nothing? Well, I, I think, you know, relatively speaking, it's not a big deal. You know, it's certainly a medication that uh, we certainly have used in diagnostic approaches a lot of times for uh, looking at lameness cases and stuff in, in horses, in particular in race horses. But then it's all obviously as a numbing uh, agent that we use for suturing up lacerations or, or for s surgical repairs. But, you know, predominantly in a racehorse environment and the most racetrack practitioners that you would talk to, a lot of canes actually wouldn't be the, the numbing agent of choice for doing a lameness exam. They would use something like carbocaine or mepivacaine. So it's probably got – it's pretty low on the list of uh, the potential for it to have any impact in terms of, uh, of any use per se in a, in a situation involving the integrity of racing. Um but, you know, it goes to the point in terms of your question about whether it's much ado about nothing is it's really testament to the level of sophistication of testing that we have today. You know, uh, we've talked about a little bit before uh, in terms of the efforts that have been supported by the industry to have the highest quality of drug testing available for our sport and to protect our equine athletes. And as time has gone on, as we've developed greater and greater technology and greater sophistication, we're able to test at, at smaller and more infinitesimal levels of different substances. And in the course of doing that, you know, the caveat to that conversation is we're going to discover things at very, very low, very, very small levels that we were never able to see before. And we need to seek to understand how they got there. And this is likely a situation that, that lends itself to that just that scenario. Here's a scenario that none of us can predict that would occur in our human and horse interactions that occur every day in a racing or training environment. And so the likely explanation here is that a caregiver actually had this substance on their hands or, you know, close enough to the horse that it was able to be absorbed by the horse through either its mouth, by, you know, we put bits in horses' mouths or we put liniments on horses' legs or things like that that can have these kinds of substances. And our testing is so in depth and so precise now that we can find these very, very low levels of substances like lidocaine in this case in the system of the horses that we're testing and we're examining. Liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, which is what people use today, you know, in most of these uh, high-level drug testing labs, gives us the ability to do this in-depth analysis that we see now. And so, again, we have this moment in time that we need to go back and seek a logical explanation for why these things occur. And, there, and as our technology has gotten better, as our level of sophistication has improved and enhanced, we also need to set the pause button a little bit and reflect a little bit on how how we handle a lot of these things moving forward for race. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going because, you know, I mean, I, I read a picogram is like a trillionth of a gram. Right, that's right. And, and like, you know, 20 picograms in one and 185 picograms in another, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate, like you say, the sophistication of how things are going and, and the intricacies of being right. able to get to the minute part of a test. But doesn't common sense have to come in somewhere? That's right. We, we, we have to, again, I, I really try to use the, 
the uh, terminology with a lot of people that it's a, a seek to understand moment. And I think, you know, we, as our testing has improved, as it's become so much more sensitive, you know, to the things that we can detect and we can find that are qualified as foreign substances. You know, we use a ARCI foreign substances classification for a lot of the things that we find that are, you know, not supposed to be in a horse's system. And then we try to understand where they fit in the scale of those uh, substances that are listed. And so, you know, in a case like this with lidocaine, you know, it has a classification, but, but, but while its presence is not supposed to be there, we have some of these scenarios like, like the one that we're talking about now that are things that we could have never predicted. You know, every, every possible opportunity that something like this can happen is something we can't have all predicted. And now we almost need to do the CSI moment to go back and sort of investigate these things so that we more for, thoroughly understand them and then know how to apply the knowledge we gain from this. Yeah, I think that's one of the big things. And I, you know, you've been on committees and you've talked to other veterinarians, and I don't know if it'll ever happen, uh, but uniformity in medical use, that, that seems to be the biggest thing. And I don't think there's a trainer out there that hasn't been suspended for some length of time because something even when we get down into picograms has been discovered. Uh, so I'm just curious, do you think it'll ever come a day where somebody's going to say, again, common sense mixed with science and let's form a committee and, and let's have uniformity and, and let's not release anything until we're actually known what's going on for sure. Yeah, I, I actually do believe in the concept. I believe that we can get to a uniform medication and penalty phase for our industry. I think, you know, one of the most exciting things that I think has come along in quite some time was a report release, you know, through the Gluck Center yesterday talking about working on the equine line biological passport. And people think we're talking about in the, in the essence of an equine biological passport, much like what we get when we travel overseas or what horses in international competition in Europe have to keep their vaccination records and things like and testing in it. This biological passport that we're talking about is actually a, a sample that's taken from these horses that actually gives us a profile of the proteins that are expressed in that horse that are biomarkers. And those biomarkers can tell us they're a reflection of, of, of administration of, of medications that a horse may or may not have seen or been given in their lifetime. And so my belief is that our investment in things like the equine biological passport that we can use as a tool to help us understand that if we get a low, low level picogram result of any particular medication and we measure the horse and there's no response in the horse, we can feel more confident that that's some inadvertent exposure that had nothing to do with enhancing the horse's performance. Those kind of tools are the kinds of things that our industry needs needs to continue to push forward and invest in. Most of these things are resource related issues and we need to invest wisely in those kind of tools that help us bring that kind of understanding to the forefront. I knew Dr. Stuart Brown would be able to at least explain it to me and you have <laughs> as I always knew that you would. Well, it's always a good it's a, it's a, it is a great topic of conversation, but I think it's very, very uh, important for us now to sort of be focused on because our, you know, and within our industry, I think these are the kinds of things that we need to sort of harness some support for that will bring more clarity to situations and issues like this. Stuart, I always appreciate your time. Congratulations on the new job equine well, thank you. director at Keeneland. We'll catch I look up forward again. to seeing you. All right. Take All care right. now. Thank you, Dr. Stuart Brown. Always glad to have him here on the Horse Racing Show. Jim Host will join us next. Is it time for a commissioner in the sport, or is it even possible? Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Appreciate your time this week. I really look forward to having this man on. I've admired him for many years. You talk about people that do something different in sports, tweak it a little bit, add something to it. And we've had several on, but we've not had a guy on who's really been a pioneer that what he did decades ago is considered the norm now, such as corporate sponsorship in sports, which includes horse racing, which includes uh, syndicated radio deals set up with colleges. Jim Host is a man that did it all. 
He has a book out called My Career in Collegiate Sports Marketing, Changing the Game. He also has involvement in horse racing. We'll get around to that in a few minutes, but we welcome in now Mr. Jim Host. Jim, thanks for being on. Glad to be with you, Kenny, always. Now, way back when you started Host Communications, did you have any idea that years later people would recognize you as this pioneer, that, that you were doing things then that's just accepted now, like putting together syndicated radio deals and TV deals and uh, things that we just take for granted now? One thing led to another, led to another. I was fortunate to have had a basis of all of this uh, with uh, – uh, with uh, uh, my background at uh, the University of Kentucky in the radio and TV department where I got my degree and to be able to be mentored by the great Len Press who founded Kentucky Education Television. I had some great mentors and some great teachers, so I've been blessed with uh, having grown up in Kentucky and coming to the University of Kentucky. And, you know, looking back on when you started everything with the collegiate sports and the corporate sponsorship that you got involved in, things that now everyone does. Uh, we'll talk about the horse racing specifically in a minute because, you know, they kind of been one of the last, I think, to get involved in really the whole marketing concept. But was it tough at first when you went around and said, here's what I want to do. I'm going to put together a radio network for the NCAA tournament. I'm going to get corporate sponsors involved. Uh, we're going nationwide with this. Did, did uh, What was the reception when this started? Well, actually, uh, it was all kind of accidental. Uh, I, I had uh, had the U University of Kentucky exclusive rights, and first year I had them, uh, we went to uh, San Diego uh, to do the national championship. It wasn't called the Final Four yet. And uh, the four teams in the tournament uh, playing for the national championship in San Diego were Syracuse, Kentucky, UCLA, and Louisville. And uh, Kentucky beat Syracuse in the first game, and uh, – uh, and UCLA was playing Louisville in the second game, and they went down to the final uh, tick, and uh, Terry Howard from Louisville missed the first of a one-on-one, -one, or uh, Louisville would have beaten UCLA by one, and uh, he missed the first of a one-on-one. -on -one. He was a 92% free throw shooter I and remember. missed, and and, uh, and uh, Coach Wooden came off the floor after the game, went in the, uh, press room, which wasn't any bigger than the than, than the small office that I'm in right now, and uh, he leaned into the microphone and whispered, uh, "Monday night will be my final game." Now I found out from his daughter years later that he hadn't told his team, he hadn't told his family, he hadn't told anybody. I think the fact that Denny Crum almost beat him uh, told him that he was the end of the rope. So he uh, said, "The Monday night will be my last game." So. All at once, uh, we've got the game of Kentucky versus UCLA and John Woods last year, and and Joe Hall's starting of his tenure at Kentucky, and uh, uh, and I'm standing on the floor and I look up and I see Mutual Broadcasting, who's doing the national network for the NCAA, and I said, how much is Mutual paying you for the radio rights? And they said, we're embarrassed, you're paying us more for Kentucky. I was paying seven thousand for Kentucky to be there. Mutual was paying 3000 for the national network. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $30,000 to do it all and take all the administration off your hands. And on Monday, I got a call from Walter Byers, the NCA, and said, uh, I'm going to give you a one-year trial. And that's how it all began. And then I couldn't sell the radio as rapidly as I wanted. So I had had a, a, a background in marketing with Procter & Gamble and, uh, and soap sales. And so I knew about shelf facings and what, but they had to do to get a product out the door. So I went to Walter Byers at the NCAA and made a proposal to him. Took him a year and a half to determine whether it's something he wanted to do or not. And that's how that started. He asked me how much money I thought I could get. I told him I thought I could sell one for 250000 And he, he said, uh, well, you keep half. I'll keep half. you got to pay all your expenses out of your half. And we'll see how you do. Well, I went to Gillette because I knew somebody at Gillette that I had worked with at Procter and Gamble, and so uh, as a result of that, uh, I walked in the, the meeting with one other person, and uh, uh, three people were there, and they said, "What have you got?" And I started to make a presentation. They said, "No, no, 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 just tell us what you've got." I said, uh, "You can be the exclusive uh, uh, sponsor for Gillette of the NCAA uh, tournament, uh, and you've got the ability of putting the NCAA brand on your packages." Uh, and you get uh, X number of tickets to the to the championship at the NCAA, 
And they said, how much? And I said, uh, 500,000. That was 250 more than I told water fires I thought I could get. And they looked at <laughs> other and they said, and they said, we'll take it. So I left money on the table, sold the first one for half a million, and the rest is history. <laughs> and what a great history it is talking with Jim Host. He has a book out, Changing the Game. Uh, if you're a fan of sports, if you're a fan just of marketing, you don't even follow sports. I recommend that you read this book because, you know, Jim, marketing is so important. You're the master of this. Just the story you told right there says it all. I know you've worked with horse racing some. I believe at one time they actually talked to you about maybe trying to, I don't know, be a commissioner or set up a commission or something, again, that would be along the common sense lines that you just said. Go to somebody and say, hey, do you want to put this together? Look what we can do. Uh, Ted Bassett uh got me to go to and and national New York racing association. Uh, he, uh, he envisioned there being a national coordinating body. What he wanted me to do was to go kind of test the theory on with New York state racing commission, because if you got them and, uh, and you had Keeneland and all of the Churchill downs and all the entities, he would pretty much put something together with the West coast tracks. And he had me talk to, uh, uh, that at that point, the woman that was running uh, Hollywood Park, Mar- Marge Ebert, I think was her name. Yes. And, and uh, I was, uh, and it was well down the line. And uh, at that point, uh, then uh, they, 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 uh, the NTRA and and Ted had, had with John Gaines had helped form the Breeders Cup, and then uh, and NRA uh, National Racing Association. They combined uh, with the Breeders' Cup uh, to – they hired Tim Smith to uh, run that whole group, and uh, he wanted me to help him in terms of marketing. That's where the Breeders' Cup, the National Thoroughbred uh, Racing Championships, came from. Uh, uh, and it was the idea of creating a, an event that would be the true championship of thoroughbred racing for the world. And uh, so I, I, I was in and out of it. Uh, I worked on it, uh, but it's been so fragmented uh, for so long, and I love it dearly, but it's uh, been so fragmented for so long, and I was so deeply involved in the cottage business that I just went back and said, I don't really think I should do this anymore. I think a lot of people probably get frustrated that they come in because everybody has their own little, uh, you know, they, they have their own little kingdom, and, and they guard it uh, close to their vest and just like we were talking earlier with a veterinarian about the whole thing that came up with bob baffert recently being suspended pico grams you know a mil a trillionth of a gram pops up in a couple of his horses and you know i think that's the kind of confusion out there and you know horse racing has been good to me that's been my entree to national tv but you know there's there's some things about it that you just wonder a common sense approach uh it just seems so obvious why not well there's no national uh, um, no national. I, I firmly, personally, firmly, firmly believe there needs to be a drug-free uh, horse racing nationwide. Uh, you've got it in the in the European market, and uh, and I think that uh, a lot of the breeding business is being uh, uh, knocked knocked awry as a result of the difference in. The way the horses are bred in uh, England and the way they're bred here, uh, not England, but in the, in the European market. Right. Uh, and uh, I, and yet, when you when you see what happened at Keeneland recently, that's the five best days of racing I've ever seen uh, at uh, Keeneland and in Kentucky. Uh, and you, when you see that kind of quality of racing, you see the quality of horses that are bred in this area. Uh, the whole area started because of calcium in the grass with uh, the limestone that we have here we're we are so fortunate to live in the greatest place you could live in the world in the bluegrass and uh so i hope that the god that uh the business uh with the pandemic going on with what's happened and with what you said talked about baffert and uh, what happened in arkansas uh, i hope to god that the industry can come together and have a national commissioner i'm afraid that if they don't do it the federal government may do it for him, and that would be that would be horrible. We're talking with Mr. Jim Host. He has a great book out called Changing the Game. He certainly did from a marketing standpoint in collegiate sports. 
And you know why there's a fifth floor at Churchill Downs? Well, stay with us. We'll tell you about that after this quick break here on the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Glad to have Jim Host with us, a true pioneer in sports marketing. He's written a book about it called Changing the Game. And he's a member of the National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame, among many Hall of Fames that he's in. But he also has, as we've talked about horse racing, uh, you met with Lynn Stone years ago when he was running Churchill Downs and talked about adding the fifth floor that's kind of famous now to people uh, where, I guess, uh, Cut to the chase. Big shots get a set. Celebrities get a set. Dignitaries well, get a well, set. We did it. We did it, uh, Kenny, because there were 32 Republican governors coming to Lexington, and the chairman was Ronald Reagan, who ended up becoming president. And uh, so I went to Lynn to get him to build the fifth floor of Churchill Downs to host that group. And of course, as a result of that, it's now uh, become uh, uh, the headliner for. Uh, top seats to be purchased for the Derby, and they built many more rooms, like the fifth floor now uh, at Churchill Downs. Uh, we are so fortunate to have the Derby in Kentucky. Think of how many other states would just love to have something like the Kentucky Derby. It's the greatest event uh, held in the United States. It's the one event when I was running my company that everybody wanted to come to. So we started. Uh, we, we would invite 24 couples every year athletic directors, coaches, et cetera, uh, and take them to the Derby in a bus and, uh, and be able to take them uh, onto the track and be able to do tours that can, can with the Derby Museum. And everybody's in love with the horse. So uh, we are so blessed to live in a state that is known for the horse. And you've covered the big events. You've been to the big events. I would say that the Kentucky Derby, uh, it is certainly one of those deals that, that really transcends sports, Jim, because it's, it's not just about the two minutes of a horse race. It's all the spectacle around it that uh, entices people to come and people that don't get to put it on a bucket list. It's the one event that is I would go all across the country, and I've been to Super Bowls, Final Fours, a World Series, uh, all the great events. Uh, it is the one event that I never get tired of going to. I uh, love the people, love the way it's done. Uh, it's the greatest two minutes in sports, and uh, uh, we're blessed here. But think about what we have at Keeneland uh, as a result uh, with the Bluegrass Stakes and the great racing that happens at Keeneland, the Keeneland sales that attracts people from all over the world. So I would hope that the industry can come together uh, and uh, have a unification of drug testing, have a unification of a commissioner that would be over the entire event so we don't have screwy states that have different rules as it relates to drug testing, et cetera. There's just, there's got to be a commonality, and I hope by the time that I leave this earth that we have it. Would you be interested if they approached you, someone's listening to this show right now and says, you know, with your great marketing background, with all you've achieved, Jim Host, would you be a commissioner or would you be on a commission that oversees horse racing. Would you want to do this now at your not, at not at 82 stage? years not at 82 years old? I wouldn't. Uh, but you uh, still got a fastball. You, I've seen <laughs> you. You you've still got the fastball. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, my mind is still pretty good, and uh, I obviously have always. I was on the Keeneland board for a number of years. Uh, it's one of the great experiences of my life. Uh, I've been uh, blessed by having great relationships with both the. People who run Churchill Downs and people who run Keeneland. I've uh, been blessed with knowing a lot of people in the industry. And uh, I would be more than happy to serve on an advisory group that would help uh, come together, help the industry come together. But no, I would not entertain in any way, shape, or form at this time of my life uh, a position like that. Another thing that Jim Host helped do, get the Kentucky Horse Park started. Most, most people that visit Kentucky like to go to the horse park because it is a horse park. Well, I was fortunate. I was also fortunate to be able to be, uh, to work on, uh, bringing the world equestrian games to the United States and working with princess high and shake Maktoum to be able to get that done. And, uh, and, uh, the world equestrian games at the horse park to, 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 to this day is still, uh, the greatest event that's ever been brought to the state, uh, 500,000 people from, 68 different countries that came with the great greatest of the great in uh, equestrian sport 
it by itself is a great sport. Horse racing is a great sport, but the equestrian business is the epitome of all horses. Well, I, I, it was my honor to cover that. I was part of the NBC crew covering it, and it was, uh, it was like you say, it was it was just something special. And being a Kentuckian, uh, even even more so to see all that. And and I wonder when you talk about like meeting with Sheikh Maktoum, is, is there kind of a common thread that if you're sitting down with an athletics director or the leader of the NCAA or or the leader of a country in the case of uh, Maktoum, or uh, you're talking with the late Pierce Lyons about the World Equestrian Games. Is there kind of a common thread approach to all these uh, men and women that you meet with? Uh, I think the common thread is the fact that uh, everybody uh, at that level is looking for one thing, and that's excellence. Uh, uh, none of them are satisfied if whatever they're involved in isn't the top level of whatever the sport is. And, uh, and that's what I found all the way through life, whether you're working with uh, uh, collegiate athletic directors, great collegiate coaches, great athletes, great pro athletes, uh, great people in the horse industry, uh, et cetera. They're all driven by one thing, and that's to be the best. And uh, if I've learned anything else, uh, that is that we can all uh, uh, be involved in uh, trying to make life better for each other and uh, trying to make sure that we learn from those who are excellent at what they do. It's, uh, it's, it's one of the great I, – I, I, I wake up every morning at 4 o'clock, and I have an, I've never set an alarm in my life because I love every minute of every day, and I have an expression – which is I can't sleep fast enough. I'm so excited about every day of my life, as long as it'll last. And uh, and and what you'll find with people like Bob Baffert and people like uh, Lynn Stone, who used to run Churchill Downs, or Tom uh, uh, Tom Meeker, or uh, great the greatest of the great Ted Bassett. So there's no greater person in this world uh, that has given his life to racing to horse business than Ted Bassett. And when you when you walk in a in a hall of giants, uh, you can't help but look up at all the giants and and have them lift you up there with them with their pursuit of excellence. And pursuit of excellence is what makes a difference in every single day for me. Reading your book, it's called Changing the Game by Jim Host. I certainly recommend it. If you if not even if you like sports, if you're into marketing, they should be teaching this in a marketing class, Jim, and I really mean that. Uh, well, it's, the, it's being taught uh, now in a number of uh, – they use the book uh, to teach uh, sports marketing classes at Samford. I just learned that, uh, which is a university in the, in uh, Birmingham, which is uh, now teaching a, a one of the best courses in the country in, in sports marketing. They're now using the book there. It was written uh, to be able to be used that way, and people can get it through jimhostbook.com. And, uh I'm I'm glad to I'm so happy that the book has had the acceptance that it's had. We're talking with Jim Host, the man who is a pioneer in sports marketing. Changing the game is the name of the book. Stay with us. We have a few more minutes with Mr. Host right after this. This is the Horse Racing Show. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Delighted to have Jim Host with us. He is a pioneer in sports marketing. You know, we've had Rock and Roll Hall of Fame members, bunches of uh, members of the Horse Racing Hall of Fame, but you're the first National Collegiate Basketball Hall of Famer we've had on the show. <laughs> well, I'm sure that there's uh, some that are in the uh, Collegiate Basketball Hall of Fame that uh, are host enthusiasts, are racing enthusiasts. I'm not sure any more than I am. No, I, I don't think so either. Uh, and, you know, with everything now, and we know what a game changer uh, this whole year has been, uh, in, in terms of sports, will we have sports, do you think, in the fall, uh, some type of football? And, and again, even looking to the Derby and the Breeders' Cup, uh, do you think there will be a crowd that at least some people will be able to attend? Well, I think that if I was listening to the governor carefully on his, his, uh, uh, his uh, press conference yesterday, I think that uh, the decision of having the Breeders' Cup is, is has been made. I think we'll have the Breeders' Cup. I think they show that they can run racing at Keeneland without a crowd. Uh, so I think the Breeders' Cup will be. I think it's still uh, uh, whether we'll have a crowd. But if you think of the what the Louisville soccer team did recently, 
uh, by having uh, some 15,000 people that came to the soccer game in a new stadium in Louisville on pro soccer uh, last Saturday night. Uh, and they had a great experience, and it was uh, televised nationally. It was a great event. They haven't had any uh, uh, bad uh, issues having to do with COVID for that then maybe we can somehow figure out how to space people at the Breeders' Cup and have a crowd at the Breeders' Cup. Let's hope that's the case. Uh, uh, and I, I still think uh, the jury's out on whether we're going to have college football. I don't think there's any question there's going to be pro football, but I think they're going to play pro football without fans, at least in the first part of the year. Uh, pro baseball is starting up again this Saturday night, so you're going to have pro baseball without fans. So I think we're going to have uh, sports – uh, competitively, and uh, I think I think it's going to turn out to be fine. Yeah, th this is a this is a public relations, in some ways, a nightmare and a dream. How to try to make this all come together and try to keep everybody positive frame that maybe something can happen out there because right? no, no one uh, has ever gone through anything remotely uh, resembling this. Been like a science fiction movie. <laughs> I felt that way when I was at the Belmont. You know, it was just a few trainers and uh, uh, the, the few jockeys and a few of the NBC crew. And it was just amazing to look there and see nothing in that stand. And you know how big the grandstand is at Belmont. Well, I just remember uh, the when uh, Pharaoh was, uh, was winning the Triple Crown and the, coming down the stretch at uh, Belmont, I have never heard a crowd any louder than that. Uh, I don't know how you felt, but I've never experienced anything like him winning the uh, they were winning the triple crown at Belmont with the crowd the way the crowd was that time. No, no, nor have I. And you know what was really interesting afterwards is, as Bob Baffert's making his way toward the winner's circle, you you know most people are fairly reserved, they're polite, uh, they get a little more excited than golf, but it's uh, you know kind of a a sport where you uh, applaud and wish everybody well. People were actually trying to climb over each other just to touch him, Jim. They just wanted to shake it. his hand or pat his back, and they're climbing over me trying to interview Bob. And uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. It was uh, it was like a rock and roll concert comes to the racetrack that day. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have those days back. Uh, I think we just got to have patience and get through the next six months. I think we got six months more to go of this uh, before the vaccine uh, is able to be developed to to have enough. Uh, uh, to uh, get to every single American and every single person in the world. But we'll get there, and uh, sports will be back. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we've got live golf back now, and we've got live racing back now, and we've got a lot of stuff back that wasn't here before. So optimism rails. And, and uh, as far as racing is concerned, I think its best days are ahead, and uh, let's hope that's the case. Your book, if there's a thing or two that you would like for a young person out there that aspires to get into sports marketing and try to follow a career that would get even halfway close to yours, is, is there a thing or two in that book that you hope young people take out of it? Do everything you can to learn everything you can about everything having to do with television and radio and, uh, and understand how to connect dots. Uh, and understand how to create uh, a business uh, because every solitary thing in marketing is creating a business that lots of times wasn't there, but understanding how to create uh, a business from nothing. And uh, it's all entrepreneurship. It's uh, creativity. Uh, and, uh, and marketing is about branding. It's, it's about a lot of things. But uh, the book has to do also is how to tackle adversity in life. Uh, there's nothing easy uh, to anything in business. There's nothing easy to raising a racehorse. There's nothing easy to winning a race. There's nothing easy to running a race course. There's nothing easy in life. It all takes hard work and, and going at it every single solitary day. And the major thing is do it with the utmost in integrity and character and work ethic and you will succeed. Jim, it's been a pleasure catching up with you. I appreciate your time in the game. Uh, you certainly changed it. That's the name of the book, My Career in Collegiate Sports Marketing, Changing the Game by Jim Host. And uh, it's and a you great can get it, And you can get it through jimhostbook.com. All right. Jim, thanks so much. I hope to see you uh, at a sporting event, a racetrack, or a ball game sometime soon. Thank you, Kenny. I appreciate the great job you always do. 
All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Jim Host with us. Stay tuned. There's more horse racing show right after this. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Again, we appreciate your time and really happy to have Jim Host with us today. Uh, Some good insight. He was a man instrumental in the horse park at Kentucky, the World Equestrian Games. He helped get that fifth floor added to Churchill Downs to accommodate dignitaries and, of course, best known for collegiate sports marketing. And Dr. Stuart Brown, who is the new equine safety director at Keeneland, to help explain uh, the testing process where it does get down to picograms, which are one trillionth of a gram, and which most people probably hadn't heard about until recently when Bob Baffert's two horses, Charlatan and Gamin, were disqualified in Arkansas because they found, well, picograms in their system of something that's used by most of us, lidocaine. Especially as you get older, you get a few bumps and bruises, and you rub lidocaine or something like that on there to help alleviate the pain. It doesn't make you run faster or jump higher but it is considered an illegal substance, but one that can be used up to 72 hours prior to the race. So you can use it on a Monday or a Tuesday, uh, just don't be using it like on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. And therein lies some of the problem. Well, actually, therein lies all the problem with trying to explain horse racing to people that don't follow it on a regular basis, and instead they hear, wait, wait, Bob Baffert's been suspended. Oh, what's going on? He's the most famous guy in all of horse racing. Is he cheating? Well, no, it's just, uh, again, common sense and science have to meet somewhere along the line. And uh, that's what Stuart Brown talked about, as Jim Host talked about. There is a need to have some kind of national commission, if not a commissioner, uh, because, as he pointed out, the government may eventually get involved. Uh, Situations like this are very confusing. They are unnecessary and, in many cases, unfair. And that needs to be addressed by horse racing to continue on in a way that's going to grow the sport, not stall it, not make it back up. So the two guys that work with me each week, Ben Chaffins and uh, Thomas Kenny, are not what I would call devotees of horse racing. And I like that because they supply the technical and the research. But let me ask you guys from your standpoint, when you hear about something like picograms and, and lidocaine, do you understand all this? Is it confusing to you as, as general sports fans? Thomas, I'll start with you, you car racing expert. Um, I mean, I understand like what's going on at a technical level. I just don't understand the reasoning behind it really, because I don't think me personally, if I were to rub a picogram of lidocaine on a bump or a bruise, I don't think I'd be able to feel anything, let alone a 1200 pound animal. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And Ben, if I shake hands with you and I happen to, I didn't wash all the lidocaine off my hands, suddenly You've got lidocaine on you. You know, you you may test for lidocaine. That's, that's well, how crazy this is. At that point, my hand is feeling fantastic. You know, all that pain is gone. No, but uh, <laughs> it, it just se- it just seems to me that with how much or how little they found in this horse, in this 1,200-pound animal, that it is some type of accidental contact that someone yeah. might have put it on a hip, on a knee, and then shook someone's hand or was pointing something out or on a bridle. And then it just happened to get into the horse that way and then somehow got connected. You know, it screams accident yeah. to me. Well, and, that, and that's what Bob Baffert's camp is, cont- is uh, contending because Jimmy Barnes, the well-known and respected assistant trainer, uh, you've seen him at the races. He's always close by with Bob, sometimes leading over one of the bigger horses when he has two or three in the derby. Um, he had some injuries, some pain, and he was using lidocaine or a substance that had lidocaine in it. And uh, they contend that's how it got on there, which makes sense. And again, this isn't about trying to try. This isn't a trial to see who's guilty or innocent or anything else. It simply shows horse racing has a need, a need right now to get some things cleared up, to eliminate some confusion out there because, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to go off on a whole nother tangent about like the whips, for example, or the riding crops uh, and the use of those. There's so many things that need cleared up and they need to have a governing body that has, a, has one public relations firm to handle the broadness of it all, not necessarily be sending out press releases each day on who's running at Keeneland or who's running at Santa Anita or who's running at Saratoga, but someone to handle this, to explain it in a fashion that the average fan can understand it and the casual fan can understand it. And I hope that happens very soon. 
This is episode number 77. Remember, you can go back to YouTube and look at all of them. We had some uh, people tell me recently they've done that. We appreciate it. Thanks again, Stuart Brown, Jim Host. Thank you, Thomas Kenny. Thank you, Ben Chaffins. Thank you, Kenny. And above all, thank you for tuning in. I'm Kenny Rice. We'll talk next week here on the Horse Racing Show.